Welcome back to another episode of Wrong Sports, and it has been a while since I have done a list. And since I did a list about the best and worst college football teams from the earliest part of college football, I thought I would go over the best players from the start of college football, 1869, until the 1920 season. So that means you will hear some names you may have never heard about, and also hear some crazy stats that you might think, that can't be real. And yes, the stats from the late 1800s and early 1900s aren't always fully accounted for due to there being sparse records and also no TV and no radio broadcast to go back to and look at it. So I'm just gonna give you that little heads up before we start the countdown. Also, I'll be ordering this list in chronological order to when they play except for the last three, which I actually ranked. And just a note on that, there won't be a lot of videos on these players because again, this was before a lot of film could be taken. So I will make a note on the screen if this player is actually in the video or not, because I do use a lot of general video for some of these players. But before I get to the list, real quick, go down below, hit the subscribe button, also ring the bell for brand new videos, and make sure you check out my Patreon, my podcast, and my social media in the description below, and like and share this video with other college football fans. And to start this list, I'm going to start with the first, but unofficial, big-time scorer in college football. His name was Knowlton Snake Ames. And Snake Ames was on Princeton from 1886 until 1889, and during that time, he has been reported as scoring upwards of 730 points. That means 62 touchdowns about. Touchdowns weren't worth six points at the time, and field goals were worth five points, so he did get some extra points in the field goal area. And of course, there aren't accounts on every game that Ames played in, so I don't know if he actually scored 62 touchdowns, but he was on the first ever all-American list in 1889 and was mentioned as being the leading scorer in college football in 1889 with at least 20 touchdowns. So they do have a record of him scoring 20 touchdowns. His play and the play of other All-Americans on Princeton, they led Princeton in 1889 to an undefeated 11-0 record and they also beat Yale for the first time in five years. And that was a big thing because Yale rarely lost. And because of that, Princeton were named the national National champions that year. And they were mostly named national champion because they beat Yale, and Yale were coming off of an unbeaten two-year stretch. They had a handful of All-Americans and future college football Hall of Famers like Amos Alonzo Stagg, plus Yale was coached by Walter Camp, who also coached the next guy on our list. This next guy revolutionized how blocking was first done in American football in the early years. His name is William Heffelfinger. And I'm going to call him by his nickname, that being Pudge, which he got during his time revolutionizing the Yale line. Instead of playing against whoever lined up against him, Pudge used his speed and strength to pull out from his guard position to run interference for the ball carrier behind him. And of course, that is what revolutionized the running game in college football as well. He played on the Yale team from 1888 until 1892. He was coached by Walter Camp, who was, of course, the father of college football and football in general. He was one of Walter Camp's favorite players at the time, and he named Pudge to the All-American team three times. And to be on Walter Camp's All-American list three times was the be-all and end-all for a college football player at the time. It was basically like getting a Heisman. And during Pudge's time at Yale, Yale went 67-2 and two and had two seasons where they were unscored upon. And Pudge would be called one of the strongest players of early college football and football in general due to his long arms, which was great for blocking for run-only offenses at the time. A few years later, Pudge Heffelfinger would also make a name for himself after he graduated from Yale and he was the first professional football player as he got paid $500 from a local Pittsburgh Athletic Association as a game bonus. And this wasn't found out until about 60 years later, but he does go down as the official first pro football player. Up next was a player who was a captain and the best player on the first best Southern team in college football. His name was Henry Siebels. If you don't know about the Sewanee football team in the late 1800s, I don't blame you because it was more than 100 years ago, but they have the distinction of doing something no team will ever be able to match because it's pretty impossible. That is winning five games in six days, all on the road, and not giving up a point. 
Yes, the 1899 Sewanee team is forever in college football legend for the brutal road schedule, but they were a great team that were Ironmen, and Siebels was a halfback and played defense and was a captain for the entire season, who started in 9 out of the 12 games. He didn't play in all of the games, and the reason for that was because if you got injured in a game, you weren't allowed to return, and that would happen in one of his most famous games, their first on their brutal road trip as they went to play Texas in Austin. In the early part of the game, Siebels was busted open on his head, and not wanting to miss the rest of the game, he had the cut sealed shut with some sort of plaster glue. Well, the fix would work, as he scored both of the touchdowns in the 12-0 win to continue their undefeated season. Siebels would have to miss the next two games due to the injury, but he was able to play the rest of the season and score 18 touchdowns. I do have accounts of him scoring 19 touchdowns, but either way, he was the team leader in points and touchdowns, and he led the team to a 12-0 record. He would never lose a college football game in his final two seasons, and was also undefeated in baseball for the 1900 season, so he ended his college athletics career being undefeated. The next guy on our list is another guy that revolutionized the offensive and defensive line in football, and he also has one of the most famous trophies in college football. His name is John Outland. And Outland has a crazy college football career as he was a member of three college football teams. First, he played at Penn College, but not in Pennsylvania. It was in Iowa. He played there from 1891 to 1892, and he was the captain of the team in 1892, and he scored 32 of the team's 36 points that year. After that, Outland went to University of Kansas in 1895 and 1896, and he played football and baseball there, then went to Philadelphia to complete his medical education at the University of Penn. Yes, that one in Philadelphia. At Penn, Outland became one of the few men to ever win All-American honors as both a lineman and a backfield player. He was picked by Walter Camp as the first team All-American in 1897 as a tackle, and then in 1898 he was selected again, this time as a halfback, and he was captain of the 1898 Penn team and was voted most popular man. During his time at Penn, the team went 27-1 and with their only loss to Harvard in 1898 and his name would forever gain more fame after football as a football coach and also as a medical doctor. He was also for many years on the athletic board of University of Kansas, alongside other notables like KU alumni Dr. James Naismith and Dr. Fogg Allen, among others. And of course, Outland would gain his most fame by coming up with the idea for a trophy for interior linemen, due to him saying they don't get enough recognition and would start awarding the trophy in 1946, making it one of the oldest annual trophies in college football and in sports. And Outland was definitely a dual threat guy, and this next guy was a workhorse. He was actually the workhorse of Michigan's most famous early teams, the Point of Minute teams, from 1901 to 1904. His name was Willie Heston. And in case you don't know, the Point of Minute teams of Michigan made football in the Midwest and also made headlines all over the country with their amazing and gaudy numbers. They were coached by Fielding H. Yost, who was perfecting his offense while he started his career out west at San Jose State. And Heston would play on San Jose State from 1898 to 1900, where they only lost one game. And he was also team captain there his final two years. The last game of Heston's time at San Jose State was versus a rival that they lost to early in the season. But the school managed to get Fielding H. Yost, who just finished his coaching career at Stanford during the 1900 season, to coach that game for San Jose State. The team would win that rematch, and Yost would then head east and manage to talk Heston into coming with him to go to Michigan and to continue his education. When Heston got to campus, he would be one of the many amazing runners for this awesome offense, but he would probably be the best of the early Michigan point-a-minute teams. In 1901, historians have been able to find some stats on his games, and it says he managed to score at least 20 touchdowns and average 10 yards per carry, which is just sick. 
Plus, he put the capper on Michigan's undefeated and unscored upon 1901 season as he had an amazing Rose Bowl performance in the inaugural game as Michigan destroyed Stanford 49 to nothing, with Heston rushing for 170 yards on 18 carries, so he almost had 10 yards a carry there. And Heston held the record for most rushing yards in the Rose Bowl game for another 59 years. Heston and Michigan would carry over their great rushing attack into 1902 with another 11-0 record, and Heston would score at least 16 touchdowns, but he scored his biggest one on a 70-yard touchdown run versus their rival Chicago at the end of the season, giving them the Western Conference title, which was the precursor to the Big Ten. The next year in 1903, Heston did miss three games after injuring his eye, but he still managed to get 16 touchdowns that year. He would come back for their biggest game versus Minnesota, and in that game, it would end in a 6-6 tie, but it would be the start of the Little Brown Jug that is on the line every year during this game. 1904, though, would be his final season, and it would be his best, as he apparently rushed for 12 yards per carry, which, if it could be verified, would be a record, but unfortunately it can't be. So I'll just say he did have his best rushing year, too. With over 680 rushing yards, he scored at least 21 touchdowns to lead the team. He scored a touchdown in 9 out of 11 games to that season, and Michigan went 11-0 again. He was named All-American in 1903, in 1904, and he was the first player not in the Ivy League or on an Eastern team that was named to back-to-back -to -back All American teams too that early. During his time at Michigan, he never lost a game, and he scored 72 touchdowns, but that could not be verified because we only have stats for 17 games, so he might have scored upwards of 100. Whatever it is, those 72 touchdowns is a Michigan record, so he will always live in the record books. Up next was one of the first best all-around players. His name was Walter Eckersall. And Eckersall was one of Emil Alonzo Stagg's favorite player. He was the first three-time All-American from the University of Chicago, as he was an All-American from 1904 to 1906. He was known as an all-around performer, as he could carry the ball as well as kick the ball. And there wasn't a lot of passing, so if you could do those two really good, you were a great all-around player. And kicking the ball was a pretty big thing in college football, as it was the only way to move the ball down the field in large numbers and this was because the forward pass wasn't used or legalized just yet. And we'll get to that on this list really soon. Eckersall gained his popularity in the 1905 Chicago vs. Michigan game as the game was a punting battle with Eckersall coming up with big kicks as well as big runs on fake kicks. And Eckersall was also prominent in the only points of the game as he had a booming punt that a Michigan player had to take the ball out of the end zone, but he got to the one yard line and was pushed back and tackled in the end zone for a safety. And this was before rules were changed for kickoff returns and moving backwards, so I get it, it wouldn't be legalized right now. But anyway, with that, Chicago would win and break Michigan's four-year-long winning streak, and Chicago would win the national title that year as well. And Eckersall was such a big star in Chicago and across the Midwest that he became one of the earliest college football celebrities, and he would go on to be named as Newt Rockney's favorite player and the player that got him into football. So there you go, another big reason why Eckersall is on this list. And here's another fun fact. Eckersall was actually picked as an All-American in 1906 as a quarterback. And I bring that up because he rarely, if ever, threw the ball. And he beat out a guy in my top three on this list who was a quarterback and who actually completed touchdown passes in the 1906 season. And just before we get to my ranked top three, this guy was a huge scorer in his college football career. He is Elmer Oliphant. Oliphant would play at two teams during his college football career as he played at Purdue from 1912 to 1915, and he would be the starting running back for all three years while he was there, along with also taking up the kicking duties. Purdue did have winning records every year he was there, and he would graduate and get into West Point, and since there wasn't any eligibility standards, he would be able to play at West Point for three years there. Now, the eligibility of players before World War II was very different, as you can tell from some of the other players on this list, 
and because of that, Oliphant holds records that can never really be broken. He has individual records for scoring in a single football game at Purdue, which was 43 points in 1912. And then when he got to West Point, he started a little slow as in his first season in 1915. The team went 5-3, and three, and he only scored 45 points, but that was still 40% of the team total. But then in Oliphant's next season, Army got a great new coach in Charles Daly, who was a former Army All-American and scoring leader, and Oliphant ran like crazy during this year, as he was the season leader in points, as the team went 9-0, and he had a 45-point game versus Villanova that year too. He would do the same thing in 1917, as he set the individual scoring record, as he has a record of 125 points at Army, and Army went 7-1 that year. And and Oliphant would score at least 10 points in every game except for one, and that was versus Notre Dame, where they lost 7-2, to two, and he didn't score at all in that game. But he does have a total of 424 points scored during his college football career, and he is one of the greatest scorers in college football history. He was given six seasons though, but played in no more than 45 games due to the seasons being eight games or less, so he still managed to average at least 10 points per game on the lowest during his time in college, and I did mention he had one game where he didn't score, so he actually has a higher average in other games. Oliphant would actually play in the early days of the NFL in 1920 and 1921, and apparently led the NFL in scoring in 1921 with five field goals and 26 extra points. He also had seven touchdowns as well, and he would retire on top after that season. And now we are in the top three, and here is number three, the guy who actually gets credit for the first forward pass completed in college football history, Bradbury Robinson, and I'll tell you more about why I think he deserves to be in the top three. But first, Robinson started his college career at Wisconsin and was seen as a huge get for the university, as he was very big and quick and after one season there, he would leave to go to St. Louis. The reason was that he was suspended from the Wisconsin team due to having a fight with the so-called bully on the team, and those are Robinson's words. When Bradbury got to St. Louis in 1904, he wasn't a starter at least towards the end of the season, but he does get credit for playing in the Olympics that year. Yes, he actually played in the demonstration game, and football was one of the demonstration games that year. It ended up, of course, not being picked as an Olympic sport, but he does get credit for playing in an Olympic sporting event. In the next season, 1905, it was a trying season for college football and for St. Louis too, as they went 7-2, and two, but something bigger would happen after the season, and that would be that the pass was officially legalized in the spring of 1906 by the newly created NCAA. The reason for the legalization was because football was seen as too rough. The helmets were in their early stages if there were any helmets. So there were many injuries and dozens of deaths in the last 20 years. The American president at the time, Teddy Roosevelt, was also a big fan of football and wanted it to survive, so he was in favor of the legalization of the pass. And once Bradbury Robinson saw that the rule was going to be changed, he went to his school of St. Louis and asked them to hire Mr. Edward B. Kokums to come to the school and be the new head football coach. The reason for this was because Robinson was good friends with Kokum, due to Kokum being an assistant during the one season that Robinson was at Wisconsin, and Kokum was also in favor of using the pass. So with the pass now legalized, they would try it out in their first game September 5th versus Carroll College. Kokums at first didn't start calling passing plays, but he got annoyed with the slow offense and eventually called one. The play was Robinson and quarterback to throw the ball to his end Jack Schneider. When Robinson got the ball, it was a rugby style ball about the size of a basketball, he would throw it 20 yards down the field. The ball would soar through the air, and people really didn't have any idea what they were seeing, but this was the first official pass. It would fall incomplete though, and due to the incompletion, it would also be a turnover. This is what made passing even more rare and strategic at the time, but this didn't stop St. Louis, as on their next drive they would call the pass again, which is what they called air attack, 
and Bradbury Robinson would throw his first completed pass 20 yards down the field to Jack Schneider, and it was for a touchdown. So a fitting way for the first completion in history to be made. Kokums and Robinson would use the pass for the rest of the season and put St. Louis on the map as they would beat Kansas and Robinson was credited as throwing an 87 yard touchdown pass. And this was also statted years later by the 1933 Spalding Football Guide as an official stat, so I'm gonna take it. Plus St. Louis capped this awesome season versus Iowa and destroyed them 39 to nothing and the passing performance that day was reported as 8 for 10 with four touchdowns. Robinson and St. Louis ended the season 11-0 and scored 35 points per game. And I mentioned earlier how Eckersall from Chicago won All-American for quarterback in 1906. And it should have been Robinson since Robinson was an actual quarterback and had actual touchdown passes this season. Eckersall, I believe, did not throw any touchdown passes in the 1906 season. This next player made a name for himself and his college while playing, and even though he passed away a hundred years ago, his memory still lives on on the campus and around college football. At number two, it's George Gipp. And Gipp's college career didn't start immediately in football, but after the Notre Dame coaching staff saw him kick and run, they had to talk him into football. So Gipp's first season was 1917, and it was the last one for Jesse Harper, who built the Notre Dame football program, having a 28-4 and record over his last four seasons. And in 1917, they would have another great season, going 6-1-1 one and, one and beating Army with Oliphant, who you remember was also on this list. And in that year, Gipp wasn't a starter, so he didn't score any points, but he ran for over 200 yards, or about 4 yards per carry, plus he had a lot of big punts averaging close to 40 yards. After the season, Jesse Harper would retire and his top assistant, Newt Rockney, would take over. And Rockney always saw Gipp's talent and unleashed him in 1918 as he ran for over 500 yards, passed for over 300 yards in a shortened six-game season. He also scored 43 out of the total 133 points scored by the team that season. And even though the season was shortened, it showed just what Gipp was capable of. And in 1919, he showed that as he had a full nine-game schedule. And he did even better as he ran for over 700 yards and had seven yards per carry with 700 passing yards and he scored 49 points. His stat improvement made the team even better as they went undefeated 9-0 in Rockney's first season. The next year in 1920 he improved as he had over 800 yards rushing and set the Notre Dame record for yards per carry with 8.1 yards. He would also pass for over 700 yards and score 64 points in the season and led Notre Dame to another 9-0 record. He would end the year by getting his just due and being named to the All-American team for the first time and putting Notre Dame on the map due to his play and due to those last two unbeaten seasons. And he was to become a big celebrity in the years after his time at Notre Dame, but unfortunately he would contract pneumonia and eventually die from a related infection and his untimely death was only two weeks after he was named to the All-American team and Notre Dame's undefeated season. George Gipp's time at Notre Dame would become a legendary due to Newt Rockney's win one for the Gipper speech and due to the fact that the future president Ronald Reagan would portray George Gipp in the 1940 movie about Rockney. And speaking about big time celebrities, this guy is going to be number one on any list that I do rankings about best college football players and really any ranking about best athletes. Number one is Jim Thorpe. I say Jim Thorpe is going to be number one on any list because he was the best American athlete of his time and really the best American athlete there could ever be because he played not only football, but he did it professionally. He also played pro baseball, played some basketball, and oh yeah, he won two Olympic gold medals and set records in both of them. But let's start with Thorpe's career, as he started at age 20 when he went to the Carlisle Industrial Indian School. He originally started running track, which he was incredibly good at, and on campus at the time was an early coaching legend in Pop Warner. Warner had coached Carlisle from 1899 to 1903, then went to Cornell for a few years, but then came back to Carlisle in 1907. And Warner had a good team in his first run, and he knew the athletes he was getting due to also coaching track and field on the Carlisle campus. 
And that was where Warner first met Thorpe in 1907, and started to use him as a sub on the football team due to Thorpe being only 155 pounds and considered deathly small. Thorpe wouldn't play much in 1908 and 1909 due to Warner pushing Thorpe to do solely track and field, and by this point Thorpe had won 14 events at various meets and pretty much mastered track and field. But Thorpe would finally get to be a full-time starter after growing to 180 pounds and Warner seeing in practice that Thorpe wouldn't get hurt because he outran everyone. Nobody could touch him, he would say. In Thorpe's first season, he would lead the team in rushing with at least 800 yards, and I say at least because again full stats aren't known due to the time and because Carlisle was a Native American school, they didn't have a lot of media covering them at this point. Thorpe would gain a lot of media attention and gain nationwide notice in a 1911 game versus Harvard in Boston. Thorpe played Harvard once back in 1907, when Thorpe was not really a starter, and Carlisle actually beat Harvard in that 1907 game. But since then, Harvard got a lot better, and Harvard actually beat Carlisle in 1910. But it wasn't the actual Harvard, it was the Harvard Law School that beat Carlisle. And Harvard was really good in 1910, as they were 9-0-1 and won the national title, and were undefeated to start the 1911 season, but lost their previous week's game. So they were coming into this game versus Carlisle hungry for a win, and also to regain their reign on football. However, Thorpe would take over in this game, as he was a running back, defensive back, place kicker, and punter, and he scored all of the team's points, including kicking four field goals and an 18-15 upset of Harvard. This put Thorpe on the map, as Harvard were the kings of sports at the time, and Carlisle would unfortunately lose the next week, but they finished this season 11-1, and they also beat Penn this year too. Once again, I don't have all the stats, but Thorpe has been found to have scored at least 22 touchdowns in 1911, some have said he scored upwards of 25, and he rushed for at least 800 yards, but I have some estimates upwards of 1200 yards. And while this was a great football season for Thorpe, he was actually training for the 1912 Olympics shortly after the season, and when he got to Stockholm for the games, he ran into some trouble. And the story goes that Thorpe's shoes were stolen, so he had to scramble and find a pair to fit him. And he found ones in the grass and another apparently in the garbage. The shoes were also mismatched, and by the look of this famous picture, they were very worn out too. But that didn't matter, because he would end up winning the gold medal in the pentathlon and the newly created decathlon. And he also set records in both events that would stand for a couple of decades. Thorpe would come back to the Carlisle campus with two gold medals and ready to do some more damage in football. And this 1912 season was even better than the 1911 season, as stats were taken for more of his games because he was such a big star at this point. And because of that, he is said to have rushed for at least 1,800 yards in the 1912 season with 26 touchdowns. He led his team in scoring, and Carlisle were the leading scorers in football that year. Carlisle would only lose one game again this season, it was to Penn, but they gained another huge win as they traveled to West Point and beat Army 27-6, with Thorpe scoring in the game and also doing the kicking. The team would finish 12-1-1, and once again Thorpe led the nation in every scoring and rushing category as he had 9 yards per carry. Thorpe would play pro football for eight years, and like I said, he was America's greatest athletes and will always be the number one on list of great American athletes for me. And that is my list for the greatest college football players before the 1920s. Please like this video and share this video below with other college football fans, and subscribe to the channel and ring the bell below so you can get updates on when I'm going to be dropping brand new videos. Of course, you can check out my Patreon, my podcast, and my social medias in the description below, and I hope to see you back for more Wrong Sports episodes.